Welcome to Dev Radio. I am here with David Ginn. He is a cloud solution architect who's going to be coaching our Open AI Hackathon. And he's with us to talk through uh, some work the team did where they uh, worked with Blazor and Fire together. And he's going to go over how they used AI to make some of the data queries uh, easier. Did, did I get that right, David? Is that uh, what you guys did? You did. That's perfect. And I can give a little bit of a, a background yeah. of the of the project that we implemented this in. Um, so we, uh, my, my team has built some open, open source projects to help out the healthcare community, the health, healthcare uh, software development community. And uh, the FHIR format is a pretty common format for electronic medical record systems to, to present data in and for, for interacting with. And uh, so, oh, probably a year or so back, we had built a Blazor application that allowed for interacting with some of that healthcare data and just to kind of serve as a demo of how we could build something in the Blazor platform to interact with Fire Data. Um, one of the complications there is Fire Data has a fairly complex query format, and yeah. we wanted to try to make that easier. Um, and when, with with all of the, the AI coming out, we wanted to look and see how we could take um, that AI to make these queries a little bit easier. So that's what I'm going to kind of show today. Okay. So um, this is the GitHub repository for it. I'm happy to share that link out afterwards if anybody wants to take a look at this code. Um, but this is our project. It's we, we just called it Fireblaze because it's Fire API and Blazor kind of merged together. Um, but basically, uh, you know, we've got patient data inside of here. This is all fake patient data that I'm showing. and we wanted to show how we could just take a natural language query. So the example I've got here is saying, I want female patients with a birthday less than or equal to Jan 1, 1983 that live in Massachusetts and generate a fire query out of that. So I've already got an example pulled up here um, and I'm just gonna go ahead and hit request, request fire query. And that ran in the background. Uh, this was already up here. I should have refreshed this page beforehand. But basically what it did is it generated that query string data for me, uh, gender female, birth date, less than this state uh, of, of Massachusetts here. So um, that's much easier than me writing that query itself. And it also helps us lends us, or lends itself really nice to those use cases where I wanna build a complex UI where people can filter for various things. I, that That's a lot of uh, conditions that I have to build inside of that UI. We've all seen like filtering on various shopping sites or any other websites where we're searching through data. Well, it's going to save the developer a lot of time to not have to to do that type of thing and to just be able to tell the tell the system what they want in, in more of a natural language, right? So I'm able to execute that query here and look and see that I've got a number of patients on here. Um, and then just just as an example on this page, and I'll kind of show you how this works in the code in just a minute. Um, we we had the option to use either AI or the original OpenAI or the Azure implementation of OpenAI mm -hmm. for this, and that's just a configurable option that we built on our API here. Um, just dive into the code really quick for this. Um, pretty neat little. This is just the, the the little API service that we have have behind the scenes. Um, you'll see we've just got a couple environment variables for Azure OpenAI um, and and the OpenAI AI service, depending on which one we're taking into there. Um, but basically what we're doing is we've built a small little wrapper on top of those services. Uh, we take in a request that includes the prompt the person wants. So in this case, it would be the, the patient data or the type of data that they're looking for, uh, which AI service they wanna use. Um, the we're, we're letting them specify the model. So this is the, the AI deployment model that they're using. So I think in this case, we're using text DaVinci 003, uh, but there could be other deployment models and then um, temperature, top P, um, things to try to, to tweak those results a little bit. Um, but we're basically, we're taking that object, uh, building up what what's called a completion request. So we're using the completions part of the AI service to do this. And, and again, the completion request, that's just the model we defined over here, um, setting all those properties. Uh, one thing you'll notice is we're using a prompt prefix. So uh, I've got this hard coded inside of this test service, but it's saying generate a fire um, R4. So that's the version of the fire API query for, and then whatever data that the user passed in. Uh, it's passing that over to the service, a few things about tokens. Um, we're telling it we only want one result back. And then uh, 
just a real basic switch statement to depending on if you asked for the Azure OpenAI or the OpenAI service to, to call those RESTful APIs mm -hmm. on there and return back a result, then that's the result that we're displaying over in the application. Uh, so again, just we, we did this with the RESTful services. Uh, this was done a few months back when these AI services were first hitting the market and we didn't have other options. Um, if, if, if we were to do this again today, there's some better options for that. There's an Azure SDK for OpenAI that does support both of the services. And then recently announced at Build, there's the semantic kernel also that's that's uh, really meant to help for, um, it's, it's serving as a lightweight SDK to, to really help enable building those AI services in applications. Uh, we thought this was a really exciting effort. Um, like I said, this is specific to generating those fire queries. Uh, but there's a lot of common use cases across other formats that this could be beneficial. Um, OData is a very mm -hmm. common query language that people have to use in web web things that this could benefit. Uh, GraphQL is another really mm -hmm. cool one. And even maybe ge generating SQL statements um, for, for searching for data or going against um, NoSQL databases like Cosmos. This can, this can really speed up that process and help allow users to query for a rich set of data from their UIs without the developer having to build in all of those uh, tooling pieces to to manage that. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. I was thinking GraphQL while you're while you're talking through this. It's um, it's super helpful. I mean, uh, takes it takes a load off the the developers for sure. Uh, and if you yeah, just go ahead and um, be sure that you get the those links to me. We'll get them down in the description. And, Perfect. Uh, great great overview. And also, I did include the um. The link you'd sent me to the the first more more in depth blog post about this too. If people really want to want to learn some more about that and follow up on the blog and the um, deeper dive demo that you did too. That sounds great. Well, thank you so much for the time today, Matthew. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Take care. Yeah, thanks. Bye.